Okay, uh, welcome back. Thank you all for joining. Um, cool. Great, uh, we look at chapter four, um, titled Learning to Minister Healing and Deliverance from Jesus. Learning to Minister Healing and Deliverance from Jesus. Um, so this chapter is uh, inspired by a sermon by this person called uh, Randy Clark. Uh, you, if you have not heard of him, um, he runs a, quite a powerful apostolic um, kind of ministry where he preaches and teaches a lot about healing and deliverance. He travels across the world uh, ministering healing and deliverance. Um, you should check him out. Uh, get a couple of his books if you can to read about uh, his ministry and what he's doing and his teaching. And so um, very often, he has a sermon titled A Thrill of Victory. Uh, it's in the notebook. Uh, it's called His sermon is called A Thrill of Victory, um, and which he preaches quite a lot, uh, you know. And, uh, and so the first five points are inspired uh, from his teaching, right? And then, uh, you know, another two points has been added to this by Pastor Ashish. Uh, in this publication and so a few things a few more scriptures has been added to this teaching office okay so what we are about to learn is a combined teaching of uh, randy clark and pastor ashish from his publication okay so uh, it's titled one more time learning to minister healing and deliverance from jesus okay so in the last class we looked at how jesus did the father's work and what were the keys uh, or secrets to his ministry Right? What? And here in this chapter, we look at uh, you know what he did and how he did it. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. Uh, but before we uh, just dive into it a little, little deeper, let's look at those seven points uh, of what we learned. YouTube. 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 Stay calm. <laughs> okay, just give a big smile and say hi, Deepu. Your mic was on mute. <laughs> Thank you for waking us all up. Uh, okay, let's move on. Okay, so we have seven points there: the will of God, okay, the will of God, the exercise of faith, the flow of compassion, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, dealing with the issue of sin and salvation the methods Jesus used, and the nature of Jesus's healings and miracles. Okay, so these are the seven points that we are going to be looking at, okay? A very simple, uh, but very powerful. So before we start looking at these seven uh, points, uh, there are one thing, there's one thing that we need to understand, okay? One thing as in two different words. Um, I wanted to use the board, but uh, the two words, one is norm, right? N-O-R-M, norm. Okay, there's the norm, and then there's the exception. Okay, it's there in your textbook, but I want you to write it out again. So norm, it simply means normal, N-O-R-M-A-L, okay. Normal, okay, or the norm, okay. And then there's the exception. So uh, why is it important for us to learn about these two different words? Okay, the normal thing, is that we co-partner or co-labor with God to minister healing and deliverance. Okay, that is a normal thing to do. Okay, we pray for Jesus to heal us. Um, and then there are exceptions where Jesus in his sovereignty, he will just choose to show up and heal. Okay, that is the exception. Okay, uh, we can't tell you, oh, how did he break his rules and this and that, you know, Psalm 115 verse 3. He is God. He will do whatever He pleases. We have to understand that, humble ourselves, and just keep going. And move on. Are, are you with me? So we understand that in His kingdom, so there's the normal and there's the exception. Okay, we can't we can't really question Him about the exception bit of it. Let Him do what He has to do. But what we can do is worry about the normal part, what we are called to do, or what we are commanded to. Understood? So in all these seven points, or at least five, you will see the normal and the exception uh, working. Okay? So the first thing is the will of God. 
is it god's will to heal everyone okay thank you <laughs> right jesus uh, kind of cleared every doubt or any doubt uh, that there is or there was regarding the will of god towards healing and deliverance isn't it so it's very clear jesus made it very very clear that it is the will of god to heal everyone right and in mark chapter in gospel of mark according to mark we see a leper coming and asking jesus uh, if you are willing cleanse me we looked at this last class last week isn't it if you are willing cleanse me right he did not come to jesus and say uh, you know uh, if you have the power cleanse me right the leper understood recognized and acknowledged that okay this is not an ordinary man i know he has the power to heal me or to cleanse me but is he willing so his question was very different and so jesus made it very clear i said yes i am willing right and that answer is the same for all of us and to the whole world right um so he eliminated any question about god's will by saying i am willing okay and he demonstrated god's will to heal all who came to him in faith okay and there's a bunch of scriptures that's mentioned uh, in your notes uh, from the gospels a lot of scriptures so jesus healed everyone who came to him in faith okay can we say that together jesus healed everyone who came to him in faith right he did not respond to a single person by saying okay today is not a good day come tomorrow uh you know uh, it's i don't think the sun and the moon is aligned uh you know i i don't feel like it no not to a single person did jesus say you know go back i don't feel like i don't think it's my will jesus healed everyone who came to him in faith everyone everyone so this is we are still in the normal thing okay category it is god's will to heal everyone so we will minister healing and deliverance and it is god's will to heal everyone who comes to him in faith that's still the normal but then there are there's an exception okay jesus healed everyone who came to him in faith it is jesus's will it's god's will but yet jesus did not go about healing people in random he didn't go healing people in random what do you mean so we know from john chapter 5 verse 1 to 9 there was this person a crippled man who was by the pool of bethsaida for how many years 35 years yeah okay 38 years yeah thank you so do you think he was the only person who needed healing in that around that area of pool of bethesda bethsaida no right there were a, a lot of people like we don't have the exact number but we know that there were at least more than one person that is very clear yes or no but here we see that jesus he went walked straight only to that one person and jesus uh, okay let's just look at that um <laughs> jesus goes to him and asks do you want to be made well do you want to be made well what was this man's response what was his response it's not there in the notes it's in the bible but <laughs> what does he respond ha uh, there is no one to help me get into the pool he did not even understand who was asking or what you know what was about to happen um and then jesus simply says rise up take your bed take up your bed and walk so it is very likely this man was not not even expecting a miracle he was not even expecting a miracle that means he was expecting someone to help him get inside the pool i mean of course so just think about it 38 years 
it's uh, I'm 36, guys. <laughs> okay, it, it's a long time. You see a lot of life in 38 years, right? You kind of experience quite a bit uh, in life, and so we'll give this man a benefit of the doubt that okay, he did not understand who was there before him or what was about to happen. But this, here, you see the exception here, right? Jesus is operating outside of you know of the normalcy so to speak but then later we see in john chapter 5 it's same chapter with 17 19 and 20 what we learned in chapter 3 and chapter 5 he says i do only what the father tells me to do what i have seen and so you know the times where jesus goes away and spends time in prayer in the secret place he would have received the assignment. Then the father would have told him, go to this place. You will see this man who has been crippled for 38 years. I want you to go and heal him only. Jesus, the son of God, has come with authority and power. He could have healed everyone there, isn't it? He could have just looked at all of them and they would have been healed. He could have snapped his finger and everybody would have been healed. Everyone. But he did it. Are we going to question him? <laughs> Psalm 115 verse 3. He is God. He does whatever he pleases. Okay. But the beauty is that Jesus was obedient to the Father. Are you with me? Okay. So it's the will of God. It is the will of God to heal everyone. And Jesus healed everyone who came to him in faith. And yet he did not heal everyone or anyone out of random, right? He was waiting for God's assignment. So how do we apply? What, what are the application from these points? Let's look at that application section for us, okay? When people are unsure about the will of God, we bring them to a place. Where is that? We, we bring them to a place where they know that it is God's will to heal them. Okay, first thing is what? If people are unsure about the will of God, if they say, no, I think it is God's will for me to be sick, blah, 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 all that jazz, you know, you say, like, hey, hold on, sister, brother, please, you know, it's God's will to heal you. He sent his only begotten son to die for you on the cross because he thinks you are worth it and you deserve to live better. So it's his, his will for you to be made whole, okay? So we bring them to a place where they know, they know that it is God's will to heal them. The God who forgives is also the God who heals. So important. The God who forgives is also the God who heals, right? The scripture that mentioned there is Psalm 103. Verse 3 specifically says, okay, uh, he is a redeemer who also heals. He just doesn't forgive, he also heals. Okay? Um, it is God's will to heal everyone, so we pray and minister to everyone. The second point, it is God's will to heal everyone, and so we pray and minister to everyone. And yet, this is important. Yet we do not go about randomly or arbitrarily ministering to people. So it seems like a contradicting point. It's like, okay, you're telling me to do this, but you're also telling me not to do it. What is your point? So the command is that we minister healing and deliverance to people. Yes or no? Why? Because it's God's will. Correct? Good. The second point is saying that we just yet don't go out and random or force people to get healed. You walk in the road, okay, you see a person who has to be healed, wheelchair or whatnot. You don't force them. Say, come here, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Come, come. Like, no, wait. For you. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> what is going to happen after that? I don't know. You understand what I'm saying, right? So that's what it's basically trying to say is that you don't force people. We don't force them. You don't like, you know, uh, you know hold, hold them by their hands. It's like, no, sit down. I'm going to pray for you and deliver you and all that. There's so many devils inside of you. <sighs> they might just hit you, okay? Third point, we are tuned into see 
what the father is doing at any moment and do what he is revealing to us okay we are constantly living so when we talk about the word of god right in, in the greek there are two words logos and rhema okay logos is what logos is the written word of god right we have the bible which is the written word of god and then there is the rhema word of god which is the spoken word for that moment right we believe because he speaks bible says that you know uh, a man shall not live by bread alone but with the every word that proceeds from the mouth of god that means you and i are alive right now because he's speaking Your heart is beating because he's speaking. And so we live and walk in a place of being sensitive. Okay, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Help me to be sensitive to your voice. You're leaning into his heart. And see if there's a word of knowledge that he is giving you. If there's no word of knowledge, that's fine. We go by what is written in the word of God, what is revealed to us. Yeah, okay, so that is the application. Are you all with me? It is the will of God. Jesus healed everyone who came to him in faith, and yet he did not heal at random. Okay, the second one is the exercise of faith. The exercise of faith. So many examples mentioned in your notes about Roman, the Roman centurion, the paralytic, the woman with the issue of blood, two blind men, woman from Canaan, demon-possessed boy, um, blind Bartimaeus, one of the ten lepers. Okay, uh, which is one of your favorite stories from all of those examples? Which is your favorite story of everything? Yeah, I like them all, but um, I think some, there's something special about the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion was not a Jew. He's a Gentile. right? Uh, and he, a Gentile at that time, was, it's... See, see uh, you, we have to understand this. During that period, there were only two kinds of people. One is people in the covenant, and the other is people not in the covenant. Okay? And it, it, it was a big deal. Um, so Roman centurion comes to him and says, and he's not even asking for himself. He's asking his, for another person for his help. <clears throat> he says, I am a man in power, and I know my words have power. If I tell a person to do this, they will do it. If I tell them not to do it, they will not do it. If I tell them to get this, they will get it. So I and he's recognizing that this man Jesus has power and authority, and so you don't even have to come, Lord. Just say the word, and then the scripture says Jesus was amazed by his faith. Jesus was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we know the secret to impressing Jesus is by faith, you know. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, nothing really impresses me. It's like, wow, but your faith impresses me. Are you with me? Okay, so the exercise of faith, just something about taking risk or, uh, and there's so many words that can be uh, attested or attributed to the word faith, like trust. I'm simply going to take you at your word. I trust you. I put my faith in you. Yes or no? Yeah? Uh, are you all with me? Alive? Okay, yeah, good. Um, at the bottom, after all those examples, uh, some more scriptures that says uh, from Matthew 13, 58, Mark chapter 6, and Matthew 17 again, it says that one thing that stopped Jesus from working miracles is what? Unbelief. Unbelief is the faith's uh, worst nightmare or enemy. An unbelieving heart stopped Jesus from ministering, healing, and deliverance. 
in uh, the last example there man with the demon possessed boy mark chapter 9 verse 17 to 29 and matthew chapter 17 you read about the same thing uh, whose son was uh, a lunatic basically the disciples could not heal him uh, but this man still you know uh, ex kind of ex expressed faith um, nine of his disciples tried praying for him nothing happened like lord what is this but he did not give up he pressed in and Jesus healed right so there's something about exercising our faith uh, and for each of us it might look very different uh, but in faith is a small word but it feels like it is so complicated even though how you know no matter how simple we try to make it sound like if you have faith at the side of a uh, size of a mustard seed say to this mountain move mustard seed mountain what do I do? I have been in that place. Okay, I'm I'm sharing what I have experienced or gone through or my understanding. Like, what is the connection between a mustard seed and is it like you know one is so small, one is so big, mountain? Like, <laughs> faith is so complicated, and uh, so and as as human beings, right? When we tend to not understand something, we do two things: we either get afraid of it, or we either give up understanding it. Right? We, because we get too scared of something that we don't understand, we'll try to fight it. Or this other thing, we, second thing is we give up. Um, but faith, at least in my opinion, what I've learned over the years is uh, simply taking God at his word. It's, you know, sim Faith for me is simply taking God at his word. If the Bible says he is my Jehovah Jireh, Okay, I don't know how I'm going to pay my college fees, my next month's rent. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to put my faith in him, my trust in him. He's my Jehovah Jireh. Right? I need a healing. He's my Jehovah Rapha. That's his covenant name. It's his covenant name. He does not lie. So I'm, good my, I'm going to put my faith in him. Yes, yeah, okay. He's Jehovah El Roi. That means he's the God who sees. I might not understand what I'm going through. I don't know what my tomorrow is going to look like. But I know the one who sees me. Are you with me? It's simply taking God's word and declaring. And just by declaring, you're saying that I have faith in you. Yes, uh, Psalm 19, I think, towards the end it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing. What is it? The words of my mouth. Be pleasing to you. And the book of Hebrews says it is impossible to please God without. It is impossible to please God without faith. And then Psalm 19 says, the words of my mouth, let it be pleasing. That means your words express your faith. And that becomes pleasing to him. Are you all with me? Okay, so application. We minister and receive healing with, our, with faith in our hearts. God works miracles and releases the spirit among us in response to faith. God works miracles and releases the spirit among us in response to faith. You know, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says that we have been justified by faith. Now, you, if you doubt me, please read Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Tell me what it says. So some, and someone also read Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Okay, Galatians 3, verse 14. Anyone? Galatians 3 verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay, thank you. 
So Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says we have been justified by faith. That means my legal status in the spiritual realm has changed from a sinner to a saint. And we just have to believe. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 says if you confess with your if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus died and rose again, you are saved. That's faith. And it is by faith. You didn't have to climb one thousand steps, and uh, you know, to be justified, uh, to roll a hundred times from one end to the other end to be justified. Are you with me? How are you justified? By faith. That means if you, if you believe that you are a Christian, that means faith is not really a problem for you. And then we see in Galatians chapter three, verse fourteen, we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. Why is it so hard for us to receive the healing and deliverance by faith? It's the same thing, right? It's not complicated. Are you all with me? Right? I wanted us to read those two scriptures just so we understand that faith is not complicated. If you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that means you have faith. Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> okay, uh, faith is... Uh, Point number four, faith is present tense, so act now. And there are times where God moves supernaturally through the gift of healings or the working of miracles where either the recipient or the minister or sometimes both are not in any great level of faith. Okay, that point number five, very important. Applications. There are times when God moves supernaturally through the gifts of healings or the workings of miracles where either the recipient, okay, listen to that, where either the recipient, that means the one who's receiving healing, or the minister who's ministering, or sometimes both, don't have any great level of faith. So Jesus raised people from the dead, and there are so many testimonies across the world that people raising people, uh, you know, ministers raising people from the dead, yes or no? What faith does that dead person have? Does a dead person have any faith? What guess? Yes? No? <laughs> a dead person does not have any faith, isn't it? So you see how his miracles work, right? Psalm 115 verse 3, he is God. He will do whatever he pleases. So <laughs> we just do what we have to do. And, and and believe and leave the rest to him. Okay. So point number six: There are times when you all all you have is a mustard seed <laughs> size of faith. Start with that, and God will honor that faith. Therefore, step out and minister to people, even when you don't sense a great level of faith in yourself or in the people being ministered to. Step out and minister, even when you think, okay, I don't have, I don't feel like I have faith. Um, etc. etc. But it's okay. Risk. R I S K. Okay. Step out and risk and, and minister. Okay. So that is moving in faith <clears throat> or the exercise of faith. Let's go to look at the flow of compassion. Flow of compassion. Um, faith and compassion are two key ingredients, I would say, in, in ministering, healing, and deliverance. Right, um, there are three things. One is obedience, and then you know, you if you're not obedient, you are not going to exercise faith or display, uh, demonstrate faith, or you're not going to move in compassion. Um, but faith and compassion are very cr uh, critical, and so there are all the scriptures that, um, that that talks about Jesus' move in compassion are mentioned in your notes, from Matthew nine thirty six to Matthew fourteen fourteen. Uh, all of that, it says Jesus moved with compassion. Jesus moved with compassion. He was filled with compassion towards people. Um, we need to have compassion towards people if you want to minister healing and deliverance. And there's exceptions. Jesus was angered and grieved with the people in the house, and he still proceeded to heal the paralyzed man. Okay, let's, uh, where, where is that? Give me a second. Let's go to Mark chapter 3. Uh, 
how you guys online doing all okay So I'm going to read from Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. It says, Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Okay. So there are n number of times where it says Jesus moved with compassion. But then there were times where he was not very compassionate. It or at least it doesn't seem like uh, he had any compassion because in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, it says he was angry. But he still had compassion to heal this person. He was angry towards those, the, you know, the, uh, the religious leaders who were questioning him. Right? And his response to uh, the Canaanite woman, uh, Canaanite woman comes to him and says, like, uh, my daughter needs healing. Jesus is giving all this theological response. Is like, ah, uh, yeah, I did not come for you guys. How can I take the children's bread and give it to the dogs? Uh, you know, <laughs> Canaanite woman is like, I don't care. You know, I for some of them when we are reading it, what is he giving all this theological response, doctrinal response now? Uh, you know, he's talking dogs and all of that. But you see, the faith of the Canaanite woman says, okay, dogs, no dogs, give me the crumbs. Uh, and then Jesus was moved by faith. Uh, you know, uh, that, that passage might not seem like Jesus is moving in compassion. Are you with me? Right? There are so many scriptures that tell us that Jesus moved in compassion, but yet when you read scriptures like that, you say, okay, where's the compassion? Uh, right? And so those are the kind of exceptions we see in the scriptures. Uh, so application. We must increase in compassion for the sick, hurting, and oppressed. Um, there is emotional suffering involved in healing ministry. As you feel compassion for the people who are sick and hurting, there is emotional suffering involved in the healing ministry as you feel compassion for the people who are sick and hurting. Okay, uh, yeah, Shani, I see you raised your hand. Please go ahead. Uh, so I just, I know it says in the scripture that faith without works is dead. So how does that apply to the healing? And also too, for application number five, it says, um, there are times when God moves from supernaturally through the gifts of, of healing or the working of miracles. I kind of thought it to be the same. Can you explain that to the difference? Sure. So, uh, what was your first question again? Uh, is faith without works is dead, isn't it? Yeah, faith without works. Like, how does that apply? Like, you know, we're we supposed to do that. Faith without works is dead. Can huh. you explain that more? Sure. So, faith without works and exercising your faith is kind of interrelated, uh, isn't it? It's like it kind of overlaps. So, because I have faith, or because people had faith, they came to Jesus. That is, they're working on their faith. They just didn't say, okay, I have I have faith that Jesus will heal me, and they did not stay back at home. Right? Yet they demonstrated or they exercised that faith. That so the very meaning of exercise is what? Working out, isn't it? So uh, you take that step of faith and you come. That means you are working on your faith. So that's my understanding of it. And uh, healing and working of miracles. So uh, the way I look at healing or the difference between healing and miracles, for example, is that, um, I mean, every healing, how, yeah, how do I say this? So let's say a person um, is in a wheelchair. A person who's in a wheelchair comes for prayer. You minister healing, and the person is healed. That means they are they were not able to stand and walk. They are now able to stand and 
walk because Jesus has healed them, right? And that in itself is a miracle. But then uh, let's take it up a notch and say, okay, this person is not able to uh, walk because they don't have a kneecap, right? Uh, they don't have a kneecap. Um, so there's something called, uh, at least I've heard or I've read about, it's called the creative miracles, is that uh, God supernaturally creates a fresh, brand new kneecap for this person. So this person who did not have a kneecap now has a kneecap supernaturally. Um, that's a miracle, right? That's um, how do you explain that, isn't it? And so uh, stories like that or examples like that is what I can think of uh, the difference between healing and um, miracles. Does that make sense, Shani? Uh, yeah, it does. It kind of seem like they're kind of the same thing as any healing is a seem like to me. I mean, I understand the creative miracle, but it seems like any healing is a miracle to me, mm -hmm. the way I look at it. Yeah, but raising from the dead, raising people from the dead, is that a healing or a miracle? To me, that's a miracle. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm sure there are a lot more uh, things which I'm not able to think of to uh, you know, help you distinguish between healing and miracles. Uh, but I'll probably come back with an answer and uh, post it on the stream section. But thank okay. you for asking the question. That's fine. And then one more thing, too. I also heard people say, in terms of faith, what our work is dead, like, I don't know, um, like, if you have pain, like, in your legs, like, if you have pain in your legs, you can't run. So you pray, and then hear people say, do something you can't do, go and run. Is that another form of trying to exercise your faith? Like you believe that somebody prayed for you and you can't run, but you're hmm. but you're running. I don't know if that makes sense. So you try to run to try to exercise your faith. But faith a lot works. I don't know if that makes sense. But Correct. Yeah, that is also you exercising your faith. So, you know, you pray for a person. We're going to learn about that in another chapter. But you pray for a person and then you ask them to exercise by the faith by saying or asking them to do what they could not do before. Like, hey, can you try stretching your hands out? You know, say the person could not stretch his hands or his or her hands. Can you do this? Um, and so that is you are pushing them to exercise their faith. And uh, But we learn more about that in the chapters to come. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shani. All right, flow of compassion and um, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that. Uh, we are in page number. In the PDF, it's 85. I don't know what's it for you guys, but are we all on the same page? Okay. Right, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we have emphasized the necessity of the power of the Holy Spirit in ministering healing and deliverance. We know that the Lord Jesus ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right, Luke chapter 4, um, John 3:34, Acts 10, 38, Matthew 12. Okay. So we are called to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, to We are encouraged to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Exceptions. What we have described above is the norm, and we must learn to desire for more of his anointing and help create a supernatural environment. OK, um, the key word there is a supernatural, to create a supernatural environment. Now. What happens here is we need to remember that it is the Holy Spirit that works through us, that flows through us, and releases the wonder-working power of Jesus. Yes or no? So we strive for that. We are not going to, I'm not going to come in as a worship pastor and say, okay, hey guys, can you play the pads, please? You know, I say, okay, now there's this atmosphere. Okay, only after we play the paths, God's going to move and create miracles. No. I mean, we, there's nothing wrong in playing the paths, but having the mentality thinking that okay, only if we you know, have good music, only if we sing a certain song, you are great, you do miracles so great. Okay, this song did not exist 2,000 years ago when Jesus ministered healing and deliverance. So, you know. <laughs> Uh, so it's not really about the song or the methods or the principles. We are going back to that very basic root thing. It's about Jesus. It's about the person of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, um, 
it demonstrates the wonder working power of Jesus, right? He releases the wonder working power of Jesus. So that is the anointing of the Holy Spirit we're talking about here. Um, and this is a classic question about the sin and salvation. Sin and salvation. So what does it mean? Uh, Jesus, when he ministered healing and deliverance, uh, you know, there's this question that we get asked, okay, do we address the sin in their life first and then heal them? Or do we heal them first and then address the sin in their lives? Jesus did both in the Gospels, right? To some, he healed and then said, go and sin no more, right? And then, or to some, he would say, okay, uh, he would address the sin and then he would minister healing and deliverance. Okay, so, yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, sorry? Correct, yeah. So uh, in the application part of that section, it says we should not attribute every sickness to some sin in the individual's life. Uh, example given there is John 9, 1, 7 about the blind man. Uh, there are times when God heals even before the issue of sin and salvation has been dealt with. There, are, there may be times when God will specifically lead you to deal with the issue of sin and salvation first before healing can manifest okay so the, i think the key here is to remember uh, is to just be sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit right uh, even when you're ministering healing and deliverance you, you you're, you're constantly seeking okay lord what do you want me to do what do you want me to say uh, you know, speak to me lord uh, allowing yourself to be a vessel for the holy spirit to function through you and work through you uh, is key okay um, the last point, some of the methods that Jesus used, he used laying on hands, word of command. Uh, sometimes he used both, laying on hands plus the word of command. Um, sick people touched him. He had people act in faith, exercising faith. Uh, they're shining. So go wash in the pool, rise up and walk and so on. Uh, he ministered healing through deliverance uh, and quite a bit of list over there. Okay. Um, and what was some of the nature of uh, supernatural healing? So when Jesus ministered healing and deliverance, we noticed that the miracles were, one, immediate. Means the miracle took place right then and there. And they were complete. The individuals was completely healed and delivered. And it was verifiable. That means people could check and see that the miracle was genuine. And finally, glorified God, not man. The focus was on God, OK? Um, so this was the nature of supernatural healing. Immediate, complete, it was verifiable, and always glorified God, OK? And so these, this is the standard that Jesus has set for us. And then this is the same Jesus who said, you will do these things and greater things. Right? And so you and I are to are commanded, are called to a deeper level of intimacy with God so that we can reveal the Father to this broken world. Are you with me? Okay. Um, any other thoughts or questions that you have? Pastor, I have a question. Sure. Uh, sometimes we pray, we have multiple sicknesses in our body and we pray and we get healed of the one sickness and not the other. So it's God's will that uh, the others uh, not healed? No, Gertrude, what did we address? It is God's will for you to be completely heal all healed. Your sickness. Yeah, to be completely healed. Uh, yeah. So it's not in installments or uh, or anything. Okay, it's it is not his will for you to suffer. It's as simple as that. Uh, so when you don't get healed, Pastor, of your other sicknesses, what does that mean? So do we give up praying for healing, or do we continue no. pursuing for healing? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sir. Exactly. So that's what we do. So if we if if there are two things that you've been praying for in your body for healing. Let's say for your, for example, let's say right shoulder and my left ankle. You know, I have a shoulder dislocation. I have do not have a surgery, and I, I have my left ankle ligament that's torn. It's real, by the way. Okay, my left yes. ankle ligament is torn, <laughs> and uh, so let's say you know my right shoulder is healed. I can go swimming now. I can go you know bowl 
all of that and um, just because my left ankle is not healed do i say that it's not god's will no i still continue pursuing for healing uh, you know and say lord heal my ankle touch my ankle um, i want to play football really well so heal me uh, so the point is we don't give up we continue pursuing uh, for a breakthrough yeah okay thank you pastor thank you thank you all right. Yeah, well, thank you for those questions. Uh, thank you for joining in today's class. Like Once again, as always, I hope there was something that you could take away from today's class and learn and apply in our daily walk uh, You know, as leaders, as Christians. OK? Thank you for joining, guys. God bless you. I'll see you again next week. Take care.